So hello, everybody. Um, just in time, we are opening our meeting. Um, but as uh, we always know, um, it takes a little while for everybody to come into the main room from the waiting room. Um, and uh, since we are very much on time, we are going to wait another minute or so until we start. So I'm asking for a little bit more patience before we, I, I'm going to say the official welcoming remarks. A much smaller base. So you're talking about. Um... <laughs> perfect. I was just going to say, and, and if everybody could mute themselves, that would be perfect, but it happened um, magically. So um, welcome, everybody, um, to our International Press Roundtable. Um, as you know, um, this is one of our regular um, features of the Aspen, um, uh, Aspen Institute um, here in Germany, um, in which we bring together um, correspondents uh, from Germany, but also from other countries. Um, and today, we want to talk about the 2024 European Parliament um, elections. Um, why we love this format so much um, is because we bring together some of the sharpest minds um, in media and journalism, um, and um, some of them you have seen before. Um, and what we love about this format so much is because it allows us also to hear from foreign correspondents um, who hold up the mirror to us and tell us um, also about Germany from the outside uh, perspective. Um, and we usually have uh, wonderful discussions uh, with each uh, other. This uh, meeting is going to be recorded. Um, I'm saying this because we also do um, Chatham House Rule um, events here at Aspen, but this one um, we can talk open, openly and again, trustful and respectfully as we always do, um, but this is for a broader public, so it is going to be um, recorded. Over the past few days, Europeans from um, across the 27 member states headed to the polls to shape the future um, of the de uh, European democracy um, and uh, participating in one of the most, um, so to say, anticipated parliament elections um, to date, I would say. And the headlines of this year's election um, have been pretty much dominated um, by the shift to the right um, as populist radical right parties have gained significant seats um, across uh, the union. And um, I don't know how you felt um, about the elections, but um, I looked or followed everything happening uh, yesterday very closely. Um, and some of the things I saw um, did scare me a little bit. Um, uh, and um, we saw an increase um, of right wing parties, um, especially also um, here in Germany um, in the eastern part um, of our country, but also among young voters. And that is something which um, I uh, I have to say, I did find surprising, um, and I do find also a little bit scary. And um, our traffic light coalition also didn't fare so well, um, especially the Green Party um, did not get um, uh, as many votes as I'm sure they were hoping for. And also um, a new party, the um, union around um, Sarah Wagenknecht, gained quite a few votes, um, more than the FDP. And these were some of the developments which, um, which uh, raised a lot of attention um, yesterday afternoon and over the night and this morning. And um, today we want, and, and this is just Germany, um, we also saw um, uh, developments in France, for example, um, which are not 100% positive, um, and I'm pretty sure Cec Cecilia, you will tell us a little bit about this. Um, so lots of things happened, and we now want to take a look at what that means. Um, what does the right-wing presence in the parliament mean for the state of democracy? Um, what does it mean for decision-making in the European Union? Um, how will this also affect our foreign policy, our standing in the world? Um, and, um, and, and certainly also, how did we get there? I mean, what happened? Um, why are those right-wing um, and populist parties so much um, uh, on the go, um, gaining so much traction? Um, and also, what can, we do what can be done to counter this? Um, so many questions on the table, um, and, um, and I'm sure many more. Um, we also want to bring in uh, later on all of you, um, so get ready um, to post questions. Um, you can raise your electronic hand early on. Um, you can write into the chat function, um, but I would love to bring you in also, um, uh, in, uh, also by giving you the floor um, and really hearing from you um, 
not just writing. Uh, but before we all do all this, let me now also introduce um, our wonderful uh, panel to you. Um, the first one who I want to introduce um, is Christian Feld. Um, Christian is correspondent at ILD Studio Brussels. Christian, welcome. Hey, welcome from Brussels. And we want to hear about the mood in Brussels a little later on. <laughs> um, Christian has worked as a correspondent for ID since uh, 2011, working in both Berlin and Brussels. Um, and he has reported on EU institutions and politics, international courts, and the Benelux countries. Um, and you um, also covered uh, topics um, uh, like um, uh, the negotiation, well, I mean, so many like EU data protection regulation, um, European Parliament regular uh, uh, elections. Um, it, it's a really, really long and impressive list. Um, so Christian, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and we are looking forward to hearing um, your view, your inside view. Delegated memo, and I remember this. Thank you, Christian. Is on the screen. It is also a great pleasure to uh, welcome Bartosz Wilinski to you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Bartosz, for joining us once more. <laughs> in our round table. Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, really? And, and now I'm back? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hello, yeah. It's good to be again. Great to see you. And um, you're Deputy Editor-in-Chief at the uh, Gazeta Wyborska. <laughs> And you have worked there since 1998, um, and you were also um, a correspondent in Berlin from 2005 to 2009. We are missing you here. Um, and we well, hope I miss Berlin. I miss Berlin still. <laughs> and we very much hope that you will um, come back and do some reporting um, mm. here again. I hope so, yeah. Um, and you have also written for, for many foreign newspapers, uh, such as the New York Times, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Die Welt, El País, and La Republica. And um, the Berlin correspondent for La Repubblica is also with us today, um, Tanya Mastrobuoni. Um, thank you so much, Tanya, joining us today. This Hi. is fantastic. Thank you for having me. So previously you worked um, as an economic and financial reporter also for Reuters um, and um, many different newspapers and also radio. Um, and uh, uh, you have been here in Berlin since 2016, if I'm not wrong. So you really know. 2014. So four, oh, 14 even. Yeah, wow. because I, I was a correspondent before for La Stampa, which is another Italian newspaper. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so you really know us inside out um, and can, us, can tell us all about our peculiarities um, and what we do well and maybe not so well. And um, another um, regular at our round tables um, is Cecile Boutelis. Cecile, thank you so much for joining us once more. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Hello. And Cecile is an um, uh, economics and business correspondent uh, for Le Monde here in Berlin. Um, and you have also been here in Berlin for quite a while. Uh, when did you move here? Well, I've been living here for uh, um, over 15 years now, but reporting for Le Monde uh, since 2010. Um, yeah, it's uh, always interesting to report, always new, new stories. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having been here for 15 years. Um, you are at least our honorary German here in the panel, um, <laughs> with also your kids going to um, school here and growing up in Germany. But you yeah. still have also the outside and the French perspective, and you have a wonderful view also in France. Um, and uh, I very much also hope that we can hear a little bit um, about what's going on in Italy and so certainly also in Poland. So the first round I would like to do and giving all of you um, the, the floor one after another um, is um, how do you interpret uh, the elections? Um, how, what do you think, why did we, why do we have the election results and how did we get there? And Christian, maybe I can start with you. Yeah, it's, we, we're still trying to unpack things because it was really a lot uh, that happened yesterday. Uh, especially with the uh, with the news from France that uh, even heated up the situation in the evening. Uh, but 
maybe I start with uh, with uh, with La von der Leyen. Uh, I think it was interesting to 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 as a starting point that uh, she as a lead candidate and her own party that was not like the biggest love story of all. They were quite reluctant. I was at the uh, at the at the party congress in Bucharest where she got a. Yeah, decent uh, result. Uh, but then they, I think they, they, they uh, found their way together into the election campaign. And in the end, it worked out. Uh, we all uh, thought that she would be uh, in in place number one. But now they added uh, five more seats. I saw a lot of smiley, uh, happy faces yesterday, especially Manfred Weber. I think they were very, very satisfied with what what happened in their camp. On the other hand, now negotiations start and um, the other news, the other results that were coming in from, from the, all the other countries uh, are worrying, looking at France, looking at Austria, looking at so many different countries uh, and ha having a even more shift to, to the right. And I, I'm pretty sure we will go into detail uh, what that will uh, mean for the, for the working of, of the parliament, but also for von der Leyen's uh, support for, for her second uh, round as a commission president. I leave it at this point, but a lot of people think this is very worrying. Hmm. So in general, in Brussels, you would say the mood is depressed, worrying? Yeah, well, well it's, 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 it's worrying about what, what, what's happening uh, in the far right spectrum and what's happening in, in some member states. And, and also looking forward, I don't want to, jump too much into the French business, but uh, what what is going to happen there in the next weeks or month, if there would be a, a change even in, in the presidency, that would have massive impact on, on how the European Council would be composed and how, how that would work, and on the French-German uh, alliance, not working that well as, as some might, might hope. But that that's big implications. But on the other hand, um, I've seen uh, the emotions uh, going up at, at the EPP election night party. They were celebrating with Ursula von der Leyen. So, uh, so it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. Um, and maybe we can also say it, co it could have been worse um, in some countries. Um, but I, I guess it's, a, it's bad enough. Um, but Cecile, you are nodding. Um, so there's a lot on the plate um, for the French govern government right now. And I was surprised when I read the note, um, the news this morning about the parliamentary elections and so quickly. Um, so what is happening in, in, in France? Yeah, it's, I think it's very important to understand what happened yesterday. Uh, France had witnessed, witnessed a major political uh, earthquake. The, the Rassemblement National, the far-right movement of Marine Le Pen, and Jordan Mabadela, the very young po uh, political, uh, um, is, is no France leading, uh, leading party for the first time. So it's historical. And uh, we never had in the past uh, uh, such uh, results for a far right uh, party. Um, it recorded twice as many votes as the <coughs> back from party with, uh, with 31.5% per of the vote. So the gap is huge. And that's uh, that's a tra that's a tragedy. That's really uh, something big. And Macron, uh, we know it's it's even worse if we had if if you had the vote of Reconquête, so France's other far right party, the far right movement um, all together get thirty seven percent in France. So it's in the in the in one of the of the most important uh, uh, countries in Europe. So. Um, it has, of course, consequence on the future of French, French politics in the next weeks and months um, because um, uh, Emmanuel Macron decided to call snap par parliamentary election. This came as a big surprise. So he wants to, I think, he wants to to keep the the action. He wants to be uh, the. He wanted to have the first movement uh, because it's for him. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge setback politically. Uh, his party is very weak. Um, uh, two of uh, his uh, main promises for the future uh, have, have failed. So he always puts Europe in the center of his political action, and he also promised to block the Rassemblement National. So. So that failed because the Rassemblement National uh, uh, had never been so high, and as a, as a, as a consequence, he, he called this uh, snap parliamentary uh, election. Um, 
So uh, it means it will be new election in three weeks time with two rounds of voting. Um, and this is a huge risk. So everything is open. Um, I don't know how much I should explain right now, but uh, um, he thinks it will be, uh, he thinks the opposition won't have time to mount an effective campaign in such a short space of time. He also thinks that the old French reflex will work as in the past. So uh, even the left so uh, um, will prefer to vote Macron than let the Le Pen win, so the Rassemblement National Party win, and he always also wants to relaunch his mandate. Uh, his party is very weakened, as I said, and the next presidential election are in three years' time. So it's important for him to get uh, better support uh, for the next years. But of course, it's a huge risk uh, for the future of France. Um, we could have um, a, gov a far right government for the first time and during three years, which use consequences of, on the future of, of Europe and of course of the uh, Gen German French engine. So that's something uh, we have to think about. Uh, it's coming everything very, it's, it's, it's hard to, to find a, uh, yeah, to, to, to know what to expect uh, in, the, in the next weeks. And it could be, yeah, it could be very, very dangerous. Yeah, um, Cecile, we come back to this um, for sure. Um, okay. uh, on, on the question, if it's, if you also believe it's a good strategy um, to do the election so quickly, you said it's uh, connected with a lot of risks. Um, he thinks that um, the far right can't mobilize as quickly. Um, but on the other hand, they have a huge win right now. So they could just continue and carry on what they are doing. And that might already be enough. So we want to hear your opinion on um, if that is how big the risks really, really are. And we also want to hear from you um, about the conservatives um, in, in France, um, if they see this as a pivotal moment, a threat, so to say, to the country, and if they might change their opinion of not cooperating with Macron and his party um, and maybe join forces. Um, and I already see you smiling, so you might not believe that is going to happen. But we want to hear your opinion on this. Okay. With this, um, I would now love to hear from Tonya from you um, and um, about what is happening um, in Italy and how that affected the, par the European parliamentary elections. Yeah, of course. I mean, this was a first vote after the political vote, um, and Meloni was absolutely confirmed. She had a boost, even. Um, she had taken she can almost twenty nine percent of the votes. So the Italians seem quite convinced um, that she is a good uh, prime minister. Um, but what's interesting also is that uh, the Democrats so. The central left um, party of Elie Schlein uh, has a very good result. It's twenty four percent. So, it's it's quite. Uh, it was very dangerous for her this election because it could have meant uh, her head uh, and her leadership if if she had taken less than twenty percent. Uh, everybody was, you know, the big old white men were in the party were uh, already ready to 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 kick her out. But she is so it's it's a very good result for. And 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 then there is of course a big question Salvini. Salvini took nine percent. It's not a good result, but it's not a disaster. So uh, there were a lot of people in his party who were waiting for this vote to kick him out, also uh, to uh, have a new leadership that would be more moderate, also more um, a reflection of what the Lega is, because the Lega has a very pragmatic basis. Um, Lega voters are also many companies, many um, uh, very pragmatic people, workers in the north, and um, so they don't always appreciate the extremist tones of Salvini. But anyway, he could. I mean, he 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 is uh, at nine percent. And what's all surprising is, of course, Forza Italia. I mean, they had a dead man on their uh, manifestos, who was Silvio Berlusconi. Everybody was mocking them, but uh, still, um, the party, which is led by uh, the foreign minister, uh, um, Antonio Tajani, um, got, a, got a good result uh, unexpectedly. It got, I think, almost 10%, 9.6. So it's even better than Lega. 
What does this mean? This means that first, and this is quite scary, that Meloni will go on with her horrible reform of the constitution, uh, a reform uh, with which she wants to strengthen her premiership or the rule of the premier. Uh, the Italians didn't learn the lesson of the Germans. We know that the Germans le learned the lesson of the Nazi time and they uh, of the na national socialism. And for example, for a chancellor, now it's impossible to um, dissolve the parliament. But that's exactly what uh, Meloni wants to uh, introduce in our constitution. And uh, she, was, she wants to uh, enforce very much the executive side of the, uh, um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the powers in Italy, which is, I think, very dangerous because also the parliament has already been exaggerated in the last years of all his power. It's uh, practically a, a place where a majority votes everything that uh, the government decides. So it's not a parliament anymore in the philological sense. Um, and so uh, strengthening the premiership would be also very dangerous because uh, she wants to reduce the role of the president of the republic to a very formal role, you know, even, and we know that the president of the republic has had a very important role in these years, also in the relationship with other countries and of, with the rest of Europe when there were uh, some scary governments, like maybe you remember the first Conte government, which was Five Star Movement and Lega. And um, and to close this, uh, so, so Meloni gets, of course, uh, enforced by this vote, but also uh, she's more than ever now the kingmaker, I think, in Europe also for future coalitions, because we know that um, Ursula von der Leyen has been courting her a lot. They have a very good relationship. Um, she wants to enlarge, and also Manfred Weber, uh, she wants to enlarge in, uh, the, the future coalition of the centrist to some elements, I think, of the ECR, so of the European Conservatives. And one of these is, of course, Meloni. Um, but she is also quoted from the right. I mean, uh, um, I did... Some weeks ago, I did an interview for my newspaper with the Spitzenkandidat of the AfD, Maximilian Kra, and um, I think you saw what happened. Um, Kra was, um, the AfD was kicked out of the identitaries. I think this was, um, everybody saw it coming. And this was only like the, the last um, uh, event, uh, my interview that inspired Le Pen, Le Pen kicked them out. And now there is a like a big Baustelle, we would say in Germany, on the on the right and far right. And this I think would be interesting because Meloni will have to consider and to decide. I don't know, Christian, if you're with me on this. Um, if she maintains this very pragmatic uh, pro-European, pro-Ukrainian line, and so uh, she eventually um, makes an agreement with uh, with von der Leyen, or if she um, if she responds uh, positively to this invitation of, of Le Pen, that is to create a big uh, group um, of the far right and right uh, parties. And, uh, but I think it's not enough. I mean, there are not the numbers at, at the moment, I think. Thank you so much, Tanya. You threw a lot on the table, which we need to pick up and unpackage a little bit later on. Um, but we certainly are also very inter interested, uh, Christian, in this connection, Meloni um, and von der Leyen, um, why this porting, if it's just strategic or if there's more behind this. And we come back to this um, in a second. Um, and the whole question too, um, how the coalitions are going to be in the future and what that means for the working of the parliament. We get back to this um, in, in in the third round, because now we also want to hear from um, from Bartosz and from Poland, um, and um, uh, your country has been a poster child of um, in the last couple of years of um, not going into the direction um, which uh, a lot of people feared, but making a U-turn. So tell us a little bit about um, the mood in your country um, and how your country contributed to the um, results of the elections. Uh, well, uh, finally, after 10 years, for the first time, the PIS party, so the Law and Justice Party of, of Jarosław Kaczynski, they lost the elections, uh, lost the general vote in Poland. Uh, they lost by 0 0.9 point. Uh, so that's, well, 
not that much as we expected. Uh, the, the first exit poll was far more uh, optimist for the Democrats, uh, but they, well, it turned out that the voters, people who vote for the peace are living, especially in Eastern Poland, they are reluctant to tell that to, to the, the pollsters, uh, asking them how did they uh, vote. Uh, but the fact is that they have lost. And that's that's important figure. Uh, the party of Donald Tusk, for the first time since 2014, uh, won with the peace and won thanks to kind of, you know, very, uh, well, uh, emotional, uh, even brutal uh, struggle. Uh, these elections, European elections, usually have a very, has a very low uh, turnout in, in Poland. There were, the turnout was only 40%, which is, well, almost nothing compared to the last uh, parliamentary elections in October when uh, the turnout was 75%. Uh, and, uh, well, in order to win, uh, both parties uh, had to mobilize their very core electorate uh, using, you know, the most aggressive, harsh uh, rhetoric. So, so Kaczynski was trying uh, to convince his voters that the EU is a uh, kind of threat to Poland, that the EU must be, well, changed or even uh, abolished. And uh, because of that, uh, he wanted to 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 well start some kind of uh, demolition of of the EU together with with Hungary, with Orbán, with other anti-European uh, parties. Well, the PIS has a very good connection to uh, to Georgia Meloni and to to Madame uh, Le Pen, uh, and uh, Tusk uh, didn't use a very pro-European voice because he's not uh, as Euro-optimistic as he's been perceived in, in Brussels. He's rather Euro-realist and uh, Euro-cautious person. Uh, but he started uh, campaigning on security. Uh, we had a terrible situation on the border with uh, Belarus. Uh, the Belarus and Russia, while well, using the means of the hybrid warfare, they sent uh, well thousands of migrants to Poland. Uh, Illegally, of course, uh, well, they, they gather them from the Middle East. On, on, they travel to Moscow on, on Russian visa, then they travel to Minsk, to Belarus, and they are being, you know, forced, pushed uh, by Belarusian secret services to, to, to Poland through the forests and, and border areas. And that raises a huge security concerns in, in, in Poland uh, because next to migrants, uh, there are also some saboteurs uh, being sent from 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 uh, from Russia and Belarus to Poland. We get some cases of, of terrible arsons in, in, in Poland. Uh, a spy network was uh, disclosed uh, a few weeks ago. So the security was the main uh, issue for Donald Tusk. And uh, it seems that he prevailed uh, with that, uh, in spite of the low turnout, which is favorable for, for Kaczynski. And uh, he, well, he won. Uh, that's, that's, that's the important uh, message. The problem is that he, he Tusk isn't, uh, Tusk doesn't, doesn't rule uh, alone. Uh, he's in a very large coalition with a central right, with the Conservative Party uh, and uh, with the left. And both his partners uh, lost those elections. So the center right coalition, the third way, uh, they got 6.8 points. And if it had been uh, the parliamentary elections, they wouldn't get any seat because the threshold in, in Polish law, the threshold for the coalition is 8%. And the left is also uh, below 6%, which is, well, a very, very uh, weak uh, result uh, for, for the left party in Poland. And that was the question how it would reflect on on uh, Polish internal politics. There are some uh, messages that this coalition could uh, break apart, maybe through this weak uh, result, because the coalition parties could could uh, coalition parties could uh, accuse uh, Tusk of well uh, mobbing them in the coalition of trying to dominate them. Well, actually, I don't believe in that because in any any any. Uh, any uh, well erosion of, of coalition would lead uh, to the well return of the PAS party, and that if peace returns, we'll have a 100% authoritarian country. Well, peace for the eight years was building a was demolishing uh, dismantling Polish democracy, rule of law, and if they would be back, if they would be back, uh, that would mean that they will finish uh, their job. But on the yeah, uh, European uh, scene, this victory is important also for Donald Tusk to confirm his position among, uh, you know, senior leaders of uh, European People's Party and senior leaders of uh, European Union. Uh, his influence on other politicians is uh, very high. We uh, had a number of 
foreign leaders uh, visiting Warsaw, talking to Tosca, uh, especially uh, leaders from the eastern part of the Europe, uh, not only Eastern Europe, but also Scandinavian countries. They share his uh, concerns on security. They want to work together. And I think that now the Tusk will shape uh, uh, the defense policy of European Union, uh, necessity of, of spending for the defense. Uh, that will be one of the main, main polls, points of, of, of Poland uh, in the EU. And the second thing is the enlargement. Uh, Poland will define uh, also the enlargement of the EU for the Ukraine, for Moldova, for Western Balkans. And I would, uh, I would bet on that, that uh, the next Polish commissioner will be in charge of, of, of uh, enlargement. But the other thing, which is also sure that uh, Polish commissioner will be not uh, Radosław Sikorski, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He will remain in Warsaw, that's my point. Mm. Thank you so much, and for sharing for also sharing this um, this this insight and uh, this knowledge mm -hmm. about the new commissioner is coming up. Yeah. Um, as you know, we are working a lot on enlargement on also the Western Balkans, mm -hmm. um, Polish EU Council presidency also coming up. This is uh, this is valuable insight. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, so the second round, um, now we have a pretty good um, idea or feeling for what happened in different countries. The second round I would uh, devote for a little bit of more insight or deeper dive um, about what this vote was really about. Um, is it about the European Union or is it about different um, different governments which are currently um, ruling in different countries as a disappointment uh, by voters on the EU or more national policies? Um, what was this? vote about and why have we seen such a strengthening of um, right-wing um, parties and maybe Cecile um, maybe I can start with you this time um, yeah it's an interesting question uh, because uh, with what we saw, we have seen yesterday, it seems it has been uh, the, the the main uh, the main the main mean of this election have been uh, Macron or not Macron. It has been I think it has been a very national uh, uh, election in that case. Also because Macron um, was the one of the biggest advocates uh, um, of the of the European integration. He invests so much uh, in this area. With you remember the Sorbonne uh, uh, speech uh, uh, 2017, uh, and now uh, some weeks ago the second one with a big uh, with a big ambition for for uh, for for Europe, and it didn't pay at all. Uh, it seems uh, that's that's it's, it's also very sad, um, but also it has a lot to do with how. Um, uh, Macron is practicing his power, and I think that's the most problematic in in France. He's is leading France alone, <laughs> very very much. So he's called uh, uh, he's called um, uh, Jupiter, you know, like the 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 the, the uh, uh, it's it's it, it dominates the entire political life in France, and that's 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 a, a, a big problem for the democracy for the other party uh, who couldn't exist and had that it has been discussed a lot during the the campaign so i think uh, what we have see, seen yesterday is yeah france french it's it's maybe not uh, not uh, the idea of europe but it's an idea it's a, it's a it's a vote against him a lot, and uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you know the far right party uh, Marine Le Pen. Uh, she abandoned many ideas that have been problematic throughout Europe. She abandoned the idea of Brexit, so French uh, France uh, going around, uh, out of Europe. She abandoned the idea of of uh, leaving the euro because she knew that the something uh, uh, people don't want to 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 vote for. That the, the the example of the Brexit didn't convince anybody in France. So that's something 
important. Um, uh, Marine Le Pen has been, uh, and Jordan Bardella, the, the candidate in this election, um, ha wanted to show they can manage, they can, they can have the power, they are responsible. So they knew they have to, to count with Europe. The problem is, so what is the next step? Um, and uh, what is the opinion of French uh, people or uh, toward Europe in general? It's hard to say. It's really hard to say because if you see only, it's, if, if you, if, of course, if you interpret the, the huge success of far right party, uh, you can say, okay, it's uh, uh, Europe is a very bad shape. But I, I would, I wouldn't separate the the European project. And, and Macron. That's a difficult part of this election. Thank you so much, uh, Cecile. And with this, um, you have also already provided at least part of an answer um, to uh, a question which Sabine posted um, into the chat, um, who's also asking what are voters really looking for. Um, and we are going to try to integrate this um, into our discussion. Um, Christian, um, if I may hand over to you, um, and maybe you can um, uh, cast also a look um, towards Germany and answer the same question. Um, what was this vote all about? Yeah, let me start by saying what this vote was not about, uh, <laughs> comparing it to 2019. And I still remember those, the, the, the feeling in society about uh, Fridays for Future, climate uh, protection, Greta Thunberg having a different role than she has now. Um, so Ursula von der Leyen in 2019 really Got, uh, got that feeling, this is a super important topic and I have to uh, install my Green Deal man on the moon moment and all that. Uh, and now uh, you don't hear that much about the Green Deal because uh, it's not the hot topic anymore. Uh, it's more about prosperity and uh, the European economy and competitiveness. So I, I would say it's pretty hard to, to say that that there's one over aching topic, topic for, for like the whole uh, EU, but especially looking at Germany, migration is a big topic. And I feel that many voters who tended uh, towards the right, that they had the impression, at least had the impression that uh, the, the politicians don't um, care enough about that topic. Um, so migration is topic number one, but still, uh, in comparison to former elections where we talked about like uh, light bulbs and how much en energy may they consume, what, what uh, glorious times where that were the problems. Uh, but now we're, we're, we're talking about the promises of the European project, prosperity, peace, security. And now we have a hot war in, in the Ukraine. Uh, the EU member states are ramping up their defense industries that's happening in the peace project uh, uh, European Union. So that's really big questions that, that, that are, uh, that are uh, taken care of or that at least are uh, discussed. But most of all, I would say in, in Germany, it's, it's migration and uh, we will see how this will work out even with, with, the, with the upcoming elections. We just, I think we just saw the beginning of, a, of another rise of AFD in Germany. And interestingly enough from, from our poll uh, results is that although there were all those scandals and uh, uh, Tonya mentioned it what maybe she also uh, um, accelerated a little bit with, with her interview um, but all all those scandals don't scare people off to vote for AFD that's that's a stunning and uh, I cannot get it why why that is and just to add a little tiny detail that uh, there is news that AFD just announced that uh, their, their lead candidate Kra will not be in the German delegation. From my point of view, this is sort of uh, um, a sign towards the, the rest of the far right in, in the European Parliament. Now we got rid of him. Uh, please take us back. Thank you so much, uh, Christian, for, for this contextualization. Why, why, what do you think um, about the young voters? Um, so the also the first time voters, how come that the right wing um, uh, party has fared so well 
And as Tonya said earlier, um, Tonya, you said um, that Germany has learned its lesson. Um, have we really learned our lesson? I can only talk about the res the, the data that that our pollsters gave us. And and they, they first of all they said there were some surveys that said oh the uh, the the young the young ones are attending very much to the to the right. They said, uh, look at the data and if it's really uh, valid to, to draw those conclusions from this data. So be a bit cautious. On the other hand, they say there's always been a, uh, a, a basis for right wing, wing thinking also in Germany. Um, so that's, that's a, a sad truth. Thank you so much. And maybe later on, we can also come back to, I mean, first of all, thank you for pointing out that we should take a glo closer look at the data um, again. So maybe the um, polls, exit polls also, and the polling shows something slightly more nuanced. Um, later on, if we do have time, maybe we can also talk a little bit about social media and the role of social media um, in election uh, campaigning. Um, I would I would also like to ask the same question, uh, Tonya, to you, um, and then also to Bart. What, what what was the what was the vote really about in your two countries? Yeah, I think the the real uh, undervalued um, topic or even removed topic was migration. I mean, the center right, the center left movements and parties, they tried to remove it. I mean, literally, uh, when I went to the to the Congress of the Socialists here in Berlin, it was very clear because they said, well, now we have a migration pact in Europe and, you know, we solved the problem. It is not solved at all. I mean, during the Meloni government, there was the biggest um, numbers, the biggest uh, arrival numbers of, 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 of migrants uh, of the last years. So um i mean it, it's it's a very very tough topic i i think it's it's very um it's very difficult to solve it of, pro of course we've seen also the chancellor he's um he's he's assuming he's taking uh, i would call it a danish position because um and, and and don't forget i mean before the elections there was this horrible attack in mannheim and i think this was sort of uh, an accelerator also uh, for you know this this uh, irritation this 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 um, I think I think unsatisfaction that is in, in in the Germans that they think that um, politicians don't understand what what they care about another topic I think which is never discussed but is is very present when you when you hear the the daily talk of people is inflation I mean, it's nobody's fault, but uh, Berlin has become, which was one of the cheapest cities in Europe, has become super expensive, I think. Um, I know many students, many, many students, uh, children of, of my, my of friends, of, they, they, they can't afford anymore to be in Berlin, which was, the, I mean, the, it was uh, sexy on the arm, no, it was always, so I think there are topics that weren't discussed, they were totally undervalued. I think one was, um, there, there's a sort of it's 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 like um, Europe is becoming a little bit what uh, the U U.S. the U.S.A. has been coming and in, in, has become in the last years. No, so I mean, a very unsatisfied, a very unhappy con in continent, full of fears, fears that of course uh, are not always justified. Some are really like um, some are, are are also exploited by the far right, but. Um, and the more you point out how scandalous the far right is and how horrible their thoughts are, and the more they send out dog whistles exactly like Trump does. I mean, Trump has been sending out these, what the politologists call dog whistles. So they're signals. I think also, you know, what he said about the SS, also what he said about uh, 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 what many, what Salvini says often to his people. You know, he says something absolutely horrible and then he takes partly back what he said but the message is in the world and the message goes exactly to the to the to the electorate that they want to point to they want to to conquer so i think um we should really uh, try to start to cope with this sort of crisis of the i don't know of the white people maybe we can call it like this like a 
like the Nobel Prize uh, Angus Deaton wrote already many years ago, now there is this crisis and maybe this has also now affected Europe. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I already see the next um, article um, or op-ed coming, um, view of the unhappy continent. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we can turn it into a happy continent, um, and that would also be one of the next rounds uh, I want to do with you. Um, before I hand over to Bartosz, just a reminder, please get ready, um, our audience, uh, to raise your electronic hands um, uh, or to signal already in the Q&A that uh, you want to be brought in and participate. So Bartosz, what, is, uh, what was the vote about in Poland? Well, uh, that was a vote uh, about the turnout, the mobilization. That was a key factor. And uh, if the mobilization will be higher, uh, then I believe that the results will be much uh, more significant and the uh, position of the PIS party, so the, our, our IFD or our Rassemble National uh, would be much, much worse than it is. Uh, there's a problem in Polish elections, it's always a turnout. Uh, Polls like the old, you know, post-communist society, they are not that well trusting in uh, state institutions and institutional elections after, you know, 50 years of having rigged elections. It's not also uh, very popular, and especially in terms of uh, European elections, which for many of my countrymen are kind of, well, strange and uh, not giving any, uh, well, real solution uh, not solving uh, any any you know, problems on on the, the place that people the people live. Uh, we also had a marathon, so we started our electoral marathon in October with the European elections. Then in April we had the local elections, and then the third, the people had to go for the third time. And another issue is the weather. There was a quite a nice uh, warm Sunday, and some people decided to 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 go somewhere. Uh, than uh, rather to go somewhere than going to the to the uh, electoral poll. So these are you know very trivial reasons for such such electoral effect. But on serious, more serious uh, issues and, and concern, uh, the first uh, thing which is consolidating people, uh, especially living in the countryside around the PIS, is the Green Deal. Uh, the Green Deal also caused uh, an uproar among uh, the farmers in Poland. And the farmers uh, protest against it, uh, feel that uh, Green Deal is bad in general. They don't care about the climate. They don't care about the uh, the standards, the ecology. Uh, they just don't want to have any you know, European oversight over them. And that would force them to use that uh, methods rather than other or to, to pay more attention to, to some ecological standards and so on. And uh, the Green Deal uh, is... It's a problem uh, in Poland, and Donald Tusk was trying uh, to convince Ursula von der Leyen to lax on pesticides, for example. Um, then, well, he was quite uh, quite successful with that, but this is not convincing uh, people living in Polish uh, countryside because, uh, well, this is more than this is this is not you know just uh, rational. Uh, exchange of ideas this is just ideology and uh people living in the countryside they they, they simply started to believe that the eu is bad uh, uh despite the fact that the farmers are uh, in poland uh, are the only group that profited uh, well hugely from the eu from the benefits from the subvention for for, for agriculture and so on other issue which is less important uh is uh, this reform of the treaties, which has been um, well totally exaggerated by the peace. So while well, the EU, uh, in order to well uh, absorb Ukraine and other countries, must change the way of its functioning and uh, union animosity, that should be well somehow modified or even uh, eliminated from the decision making process. The PIS started a huge campaign saying that uh, the EU is going to is going to, trans to be transformed into a kind of super state uh, under German hegemony and uh, the Poland will be degraded and will be ruled by the Germany. And of course, this is also absurd. But for peace voters, they are like, you know, Donald Trump voters. There are a lot of similarities. They still also believe in their in the, 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 uh, leader, uh, believe in everything their leader says. Uh, this is, this is the, the, the reality Poland face. And this German, anti-German factor is also important. Well, the, the Donald Tusk is being constantly accused of being a pro-German politician and of being a, a German himself. 
And the last point, uh, well, you didn't mention that. Uh, this is the Russian influence. Russian influence is, is, is terrible across the Europe. We observe that over social networks. We observe that on uh, influence on political parties. We observe that, uh, well, almost everywhere, uh, anti-European propaganda is being supported by Russia heavily and is being supported by Russian praxis. And we can't forget that, that uh, Madame Le Pen, she took a loan in Russian bank. So Putin uh, let her money. Uh, that the uh, people from the IFD, from uh, FPÖ, from uh, Lega, they all got uh, Russian uh, connections and they all, all work as a Russian uh, proxies in Europe. And well, the worst case of, of that politics is uh, is uh, Viktor Orban, who is well, the kind of train horse of, of, of Russia in, in Europe. And uh, well, well, when it turned out in uh, the United States, how much damage the Russian did with their hybrid warfare against the US, uh, there were sanctions, uh, there were, well, quite a sharp and snap response of uh, Barack Obama administration against Russia. And I have the feeling that Europe uh, observed that what Russia is doing with, uh, with people's minds uh, uh, quite uh, relaxed and uh, can't take uh, any appropriate actions uh, against that. Also, we ha we've had uh, since 2014, we've had uh, about the Stratcom, about, uh, well, resilience, uh, media literacy, and so on. And, well, like usual, nothing nothing changes. We are still vulnerable in that area. And, and the, Russia uses that, uh, well, with uh, great expertise. And uh, the fact that the IFD is the number two party in, in Germany and then Russian Bloc National leads uh, in polls in France, that's a Russian victory. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a really enlightening second round, um, and we collected um, a lot of insight on what this vote was about. Um, and there were differences in your respective countries, but also a lot of similarities. Um, I take along or um, I take away um, lots of di different topics um, on the um, effect of EU policies on rural areas, Green Deal, the issue of migration, um, Russian influence, disinformation, a disconnect between policy making um, and the people, um, economic um, issues like uh, inflation, um, and in general, a vote on current policy. Um, I still don't see a lot of hands coming up. So yes, now I thank you so much. So Niels, over to you. Um, the floor is yours. No, thank you very much, Niels, uh, my own of Ecologic and Democracy Reporting International. Um, I was wondering, um, Tonya, I have a question for you um, in particular and also Cecile. Um, we have talked about the surge of far-right um, um, parties in this conversation quite a bit. If we look to Northern Europe and Eastern Europe, maybe we have a different picture somewhat. So, I mean, the, the focus on Italy and France has th this implication. I was wondering, um, Tonya, um, you talked about... Um, um, Meloni's plans to reform the constitution, to what extent is actually possible? I mean, I would assume they need a qualified majority to do this. Um, and to what extent this party has actually moderated over time? Is this something, I mean, what can we actually learn from that? And the same question for Cecile. I mean, is there anything that, I mean, you spoke about um, Le Pen abandoning some EU positions, but what else is there? I mean, can we actually, I mean, get some more insights on, on that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, um, Niels. Um, and over, we collect a few comments and questions. Um, over to Sabine, then Frank, and then Daniel. Hi, Sabine Dietrich. I'm a, a non-executive director on a couple of companies. Thank you for, <laughs> for already asking <laughs> or answering one of my questions. I think I have a question particularly to Christian Feld, because I'm really interested in the views on how to break up contemplation and, and 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 recreate interest in politics and effects for people on the one hand and the other hand um, in, 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 or in the contrary how do we train politicians to think outside of their box their bubble and really to engage citizens and 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 really make politic meaningful for people i mean it's just the the disconnect of language i think sometimes so but i leave it to you to help me to sort this out <laughs> this is this is a huge question christian to you um and i'm sure that some parties would love to have the answer very quickly um and over to frank thank you um 
head of legal and personal affairs with the Zeit Verlags Group, uh, a German media house. Um, interesting to, to listen to you, and, and you were just elaborating on things, why people turned away from the parties they might have elected last time. My question is, was it a, a vote against migration and uh, the discontent with domestic issues, or was it also one against Europe? Because many of those companies are not in favor of the union. Um, and I'm wondering, may we see, especially looking at uh, China, Russia, America, parties that will still want to enforce or strengthen the union as, uh, as, some, as a continent of relevance? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for also bringing us back to the Europe question. Um, because uh, some of the parties which did realize big wins are also not very pro-European, but they were Euro European skeptic or EU skeptic um, in their election um, campaigns. And over to you, Daniel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel. I'm a chief strategist at uh, Gowling, which is an Anglo-Canadian global consultancy, also board member and professor at the School for Board Effectiveness. My question is um, building on some of what we've heard today, and I thank you for all of those insights. Um, the <clears throat> poll developments over the last years have, of course, forced <laughs> politics to, um, to, to realize uh, the shift to the right. And I think we have been forced to become good at analyzing that. Um, my question is, what do we do about it? And it is absolutely clear that um, there are many games going on, many national games going on, and every nation has probably a different set of challenges requiring a different set of answers. However, is are we on a European level bound to just wait and see and hope that the national member states find the right answers? Or is there a national, a, a cross-national European-led um, analysis, analysis to solution and solution to implementation to fight back? Uh, another big question. Um, and uh, I would love to see this, um, the not right-wing parties overcoming their differences and all joining forces um, in this pivotal moment. Um, I am curious um, if there is some optimism on this front. Um, it also comes back to one of the questions which I um, asked uh, Cecile earlier on um, with regard to the Conservative Party in France. So we have a lot of questions on, on the table now. So because um, Tanya, you got a lot of them in the beginning, maybe you want to uh, make a head start. Yes, so... Um, on the first question about the, the constitutional reform, um, yes, Meloni would require a qualified majority in the parliament to vote this, but she could also do it, force the things with a simple majority, and then uh, the Italians would have to vote um, to approve it through a referendum. This was something that, for example, Matteo Renzi tried when he was prime minister. You remember it was a total failure. Um, and he had uh, also his reform voted, but yes, I mean, so so uh, the answer is she can do it, and I think she will accelerate now. I mean, uh, probably it will be approved in the next weeks in the Senate and so on. She will she will force this. She's really convinced of this reform, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, then I don't remember the second question you you posed. I'm sorry. Uh, was it about? Uh, Meloni, um, why she was so strong? Did I get it right? Why she's so strong? Um, no, I mean, it was more like about. I mean, I mean, this whole conversation about Meloni um, becoming more moderate. Um, to what extent yeah. is this actually? I mean, can you? I mean, or shed some light ah, okay, on that? Okay, okay, okay. Now I get it. This is this is a total fata morgana. I mean. Meloni is doing a total ambivalent play. She In Europe, she is uh, giving this uh, pragmatic and very pro-European, pro-Ukrainian, and she's a very adamant on this, uh, on the pro-European line. But uh, in the country, we see a very, very scary um, development. For example, in the media, 
In the media, you have a very urban-like repression. Uh, the public uh, media have been totally put under control of uh, Meloni's party and Meloni's allies. Then don't forget, she has already a partner like Forza Italia, who owns other three televisions, uh, the Mediaset, the Berlusconi televisions. And she's trying to put a lot of pressure also uh, through newspapers. There is one, one publisher. He is also, which is very, uh, an, an Italian, another Italian oh. anomaly. He owns three big right-wing newspapers and he's a senator of Fratelli d'Italia. Yeah, His well, name is Angelucci. Well, and, um, so well, he is really, really uh, trying to, um, trying to repress uh, free media. She is very uh, allergic to free media. You see this also in press conferences and in the rare press conferences she gives. Uh, she is very aggressive with my newspaper, of course, Repubblica, because my newspaper is a private newspaper and it's very clearly an opposition newspaper. But she's also, I mean, she's aggressive with every opposition newspaper. Um, so what's happening in the media is very scary because the the blueprint is really what happened in the last years uh, in Poland and, and, and in Hungary. So this is really her model. I mean, it's not a case. She's a partner of, uh, she's been a partner of peace, of the Polish peace in the conservative. She has a very good relationship with them. And of course, everybody knows what a strong uh, relationship she, she always had with, uh, with Orban. Although, I mean, on some topics, of course, she, she she tried to be more moderate for example on migration she had uh, she had promised in the, in the electoral campaign that she would do this uh, mysterious uh, naval blockade nobody knows how it uh, should work but then she didn't uh, eventually she went to europe and she went with ursula von der leyen to tunisia to albania you know she tried to be pragmatic and so she's very ambivalent but also she's repressing rights in, in Italy, I mean, uh, uh, two dozens of, of mothers, of children, uh, lesbian mothers, uh, have been uh, strapped of their children because uh, they don't, the, 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 the local uh, um, authorities don't accept anymore that they are mothers uh, of, of their children if they are not biological mothers, you know. It was married couples and uh, women couples and they were uh, torn of their rights. Um, this is happening in Italy. Um, so on the interior side, and I'm, I'm also wondering why so many correspondents don't, don't write about this from Italy, you know, foreign correspondents. Why don't they um, say this? Or why don't they say that there are still demonstrations in Italy where people go around with this sign, which is the fascist sign. It is forbidden in Germany. It is not forbidden in Italy, but you know, and there are some politicians going with them. So there is, I think, um, and to close my intervention, is this a vote against Europe? I don't think so in Italy, because uh, all, even if Salvini is always using this uh, a little bit old rhetoric of the European bureaucracy, but I mean, we have been, uh, we have been the, the biggest, um, uh, we, we have been very, very, literally, uh, how do you say, um, the recovery fund has been a big gift to Italy. You know, it's 200 billions, 200 billions that were given to us after the COVID. And so that we're spending very slowly, but we're spending. So this is, this time, it, I think it's not about Europe. It's really about, it's really about some topics that uh, haven't been discussed properly, like, uh, like migration, like inflation, like other topics that are really worrying people. Thank you uh, so much. Over to you, Christian. Yeah, I will react to, I think, was Sabine's question, uh, how the uh, EU or EU politicians could get out of their box and have a new thinking. And I understood the question in a way that how, how can they get a new connection between uh, the people and uh, the politicians or bureaucrats, however you want to call it. Um, but first of all, I think it has the, the the attitude has changed. Um, I think for a long time there were lots of like uh, yeah, Europhiles. They like blinded by by the European idea, and, and and you cannot criticize it because it's it's such a valuable, um, great thing. 
and in, in, a, in a, to a certain degree it is. But on the other hand, um, there have, there have been like for, for decades, there have been uh, politicians that promised that the EU wants to be big on big things and small on small things. On the other hand, you have got uh, a lot of uh, people working here uh, on regulations. So if you pay them uh, to do regulation, then they will do regulation. Uh, of course, there's always the talk of uh, cutting red tape and stuff like that. Um, on the other hand, I would say, I mentioned it earlier, that there are big questions that have to be solved. And maybe this also touches on the, on the question how to deal with China and, 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 uh, and the US. Um, and maybe a first step would be to, to, to better promote uh, the success stories that, that uh, the Europe, uh, European Union has written, from my point of view, uh, over the, the last years. Uh, just take two things, the, uh, the, the pandemic, um, the, the, uh, the, the organization of, of vaccines started slowly and it was a, a bit bumpy in the, in the beginning. But then we had enough vaccines for, for, the, for the whole of Europe and not just the countries that could afford buying them. There are still open questions. What was the role of Ursula von der Leyen? Did she send text messages to, to Pfizer or whatever? But in the end, we had actually we had too much vaccine. Um, and the other one is uh, when, when Russia attacked the Ukraine, uh, there, was, there was very much fear of, of energy prices rising and, and, that, and uh, hurting uh, the citizens. And I think from my point of view, uh, the EU managed quite well to, 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 uh, to cope with, with that problem. So maybe they, sh they should start uh, better uh, promoting those success stories and uh, yeah, and, and really be big on big things and small and small things. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, over to Bartos. Yeah, I'd like to uh, answer the question on uh, on dealing with uh, with populism, as, as I understand it. Uh, well, I don't think that situation is hopeless for for the mainstream, for for politicians of of the mainstream uh, parties. Uh, this example of, of Scandinavian countries, well, the far right got beaten there. This example of Poland, and there's also somehow uh, the example of Hungary. Well, the, this new party founded by uh, Peter Maja, uh, party Tisa, uh, well, caused uh, Viktor Orban uh, a lot of problems. Uh, got 33 points. Uh, the Orban got fought only 44 because, well, we are dealing with Hungary, an authoritarian state, which is totally tilted. There is no uh, free media in Hungary. So making a, a normal uh, campaign is also quite impossible. And uh, Peter Maga uh, achieved a uh, success and, and hopefully he will he will continue uh, on, on that. Uh, I believe that the first condition uh, in order to beat the, 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 the far right, to beat the populist, is to acknowledge that uh, uh, the populists ask the, the, the correct questions. Uh, they point out the, the real problems. They have a better connection to, to, to the people who, who suffer, who are not, uh, um, uh, who are not uh, well happy with some uh, results of, 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 of uh, political uh, decisions. Uh, but the problem with populists is that they formulate uh, wrong answers, that the answers are too, uh, too short, too, um, too simple for most complex issues. So the, the problem is to, uh, to, well, hear the proper questions and, and to give them a proper and uh, not uh, too simple uh, answer. So uh, Donald Tusk uh, is able to, to, to deliver that. Uh, I believe that the Danish prime minister was also successful in, in that. So, so that, that this is the way, uh, this is the way to, to, to follow. Uh, you need to Mm, not consider uh, far right as a kind of evil enemy that can't be beaten because they are, I don't know, too strong, uh, supported by Russia, supported by Trump, uh, kind of, you know, uh, phenomenon coming of the, the zeitgeist. No, this is this is not not the point. And there was a question, how should uh, the politicians change? Uh, what should be a uh, change in the formation of politicians? And uh, I'd like to be controversial. Uh, I'd love to have uh, social media shut up shut down, uh, because I believe that uh, the impact the social media did on the polarization in Europe uh, is just terrible. Uh, we started uh, to hate each other. And my problem, my, my, my main problem with social media is that they, they belong to American uh, companies, that the Americans are making huge profits 
on that that we fight with each other, the, the, that we hate each other, that uh, the polarization gets deeper and deeper and the algorithm, social media, um, uh, well, the, the base on that, that people are, are polarized, that there's a conflict, that there's a you know, hateful exchange uh, between, between people. So if the politicians want to start transforming our political and, and the social environment, uh, start to be more active uh, against this, you know, foreign driven uh, politics of, of, of social media. Well, there is a third actor in, 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 in the play, which is manipulating with, with our minds also. Uh, and uh, that has to stop as well as the, as the Russian influence in, in Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, also, a whole new can of worms, which you just uh, opened shortly before the end um, of our discussion. We have an event coming up um, early July um, in, in, in Berlin on, on site, um, not hybrid, but really on site, um, where we want to look at media um, in time of an environment which is changing and the responsibility of media. So please join us. Um, and we are, I'm sure we are also going to talk about um, uh, social media and we are inviting somebody from TikTok to join us. So last but not least, Cecile, and maybe you can also um, answer the question if there is hope with regard to coalition building between um, the middle, center, right and left parties within countries and across Europe. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. I, I would maybe start uh, start with uh, with a point. Uh, I'm I'm pretty much in in favor of, of what w w I agree with what uh, um, Bart just said. Uh, sometimes I think we shouldn't exaggerate a question of substance of solution and political ideas. Sometimes politics and more and more there is a question of emotion and it's very short term reaction. Macron mentioned in his in his speech in Dresden, uh, social networks change politics we have talked about about it maybe we need to imagine there is a positive emotion to in France toward a young leader Jordan Badella who seems to be closer to the people authentic and above um, uh, and, and above all a blank slate a blank a blank paper so we can write everything on it and and hope and, and all your hope and you all also have this sense of this uh, this need of security and that's uh, was one of the question uh, what could you could give you the sense of security the sense of, of you feel you feel safe again in this world full of crisis and I'm not sure for example I would discuss maybe with what uh, Christian uh, Fall said uh, I'm not sure that the vaccine uh, vaccination uh, debate or the vaccination uh, solution of Europe contributed to a, a, a positive image of, of Europe, not everywhere. And uh, in many of my reports, I, I had the feeling uh, this issue uh, of being obliged to, to vaccine and receive vaccination from Brussels and so on has been seen as a as a, as a threat, as something dangerous uh, or something that people uh, were not very legitimately made. That was in, in many, many places where I, I've, I've been, it, it's been a, a, a huge, one of the most discussed issues vaccination. And that's why I'm not sure that those success that we see as a success, because we are very well educated, we know that people with that vaccination is good. Many people see don't see that that, that way. So we won't we won't be able to convince them with uh, maybe with rational, I don't know, with rational arguments, uh, if they are uh, reading some other information about uh, that uh, are saving their emotion, their short term emotion, that sense of being, oh, I'm, 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 I'm losing everywhere, everything, I'm losing control of my life. That's also very, very strong. If in, for example, when I, I've been in the German industry in some, um, yeah, some, some, some factories, even very rich factories of Southwest Germany, they, they, they are afraid of losing their place, their their job, the industry they are very proud of. So a part of their identity is 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 maybe is changing. They are losing something, and that's 
a very short term emotion, you cannot yeah, you, you cannot respond with, yeah, we, we, we were very good on Ukraine crisis response. I don't think it's, it's going to work, even if it's very good. But when you see uh, our President Macron again uh, had a very good, yeah, very actually good results in um, in European, uh, 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 in the in terms of French influence in, in Europe, French influence in European uh, politics, and also influence in the world, it didn't work at all. It didn't work at all. So we have to think about a better way to communicate with each other and to meet each other in maybe in real life. And that's uh, that's why I'm, 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 I agree with with you, Bart, about. Yeah, renewing politics in in, in, in times of, of, of social media. Um, about a possible coalition <laughs> with uh, between Macron uh, party and 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 uh, the conservatives. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's really hard. So it's a huge. Um, I don't know. It's it's a, it's a rich, huge bet, and I'm it's not sure that it's going to to work. Why? Because. Macron built his party on his person. And at the end, uh, so 2027, uh, at the end of his mandate, he doesn't candidate anymore. So he has no political future. So what would you correlate with a, with a party which has no future? Because there is no successor. There is no strategy for what's going to be, uh, what, is, what is the future of the party after Macron, I don't see anyone, and uh, that's why I'm not sure they uh, maybe the, the the conservatives. So they, they had a very low results yesterday, so seven point five percent maybe. So it's uh, anyway we were very low, and um, they feel that the the dynamic, the political dynamic, in is is on the far far right. So it's one one scenario is that they they are trying to maybe to to create uh, uh, yeah to join the movement on the right to try to lower or to make something yeah so to to create a party uh, like yeah what what did what did uh, as, on, a, as a, on, on the example of of Meloni in 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 in, it, in Italy in the hope that it's going to work and to to win the next election that would be a, a scenario but at this time it's really hard to to know because it's depend on the dynamics on the next weeks at the end of the of the of the of the, of the months we will know more about the question whether the French say everything we want to uh, to avoid far, far right parties so we want to vote to, to give more more thanks to the to the classical Demo democratic party or the those selling walls the, those walls are over we are we and we are entering in another another time of poli of, of political life, life in france where like in the north um the, the the far right and the classic and the conservative are, are, are governing together that would be also an option thank you very very much um unfortunately we are already at the end of our round table there are so many more questions to ask and to answer um about every i would love to go um into every single policy area now with you what does it mean for the green deal what does it mean for security and defense what does it mean for migration we can't do this today, um, but I think we have um, more time to do so um, in our events um, at our institute and many others um, before the summer break and also down into the fall when we maybe also have a slightly better picture um, of uh, what is going to happen with all the coalition building now going on. And when we get a slightly better idea also how the next commission is going to look like. Um, and we will get back to you, Christian, for more insight on this as well. Um, and the earlier, the better. So this has been an exciting meeting. Thank you so very much. Um, if I would combine uh, two statements um, which have been made uh, by Tonya and Bart, I would summarize our meeting as not hopeless for the unhappy continent. <laughs>
<laughs> so there's still hope. Um, and if I combine another couple of statements, but we have to work for it um, and don't blame the voter. Um, so thank you very much. I think this gives all of us a little bit more to do. Um, and as I promised, uh, we brought to you um, some of the sharpest journalistic uh, minds um, here in Europe and in Germany. So thank you so much uh, once again, Bart, uh, Tanya, Cecile, and Christian. And I hope to see um, all of you again very so soon, either on the ground, in our premises, or digitally. And with this, I wish all of you a good lunch break. So thank you very much. Thank you.